Hey guys, Creative the Lazy Geek here, and today we're going to talk about LRGB processing workflow. This is a request that I've had multiple times about like how do I first image using uh, luminance red, green, and blue filters and a monochrome camera. Um, and how do I process those images? Now, I'm going to focus on the processing part of things, especially the post-processing really today, um, because it is actually very similar to a simple color camera picture. Uh, the only thing that really changes is uh, the uh, way you get from your stacks of frames. You'll have four frames to combine them into a single uh, color image. And sometimes it can be a bit difficult to understand how to actually do that properly and it is true that it increases complexity of your processing workflow now in terms of the uh, pre-processing workflow on how to actually process uh, the stacks separately of those uh, images like you'll have one stack for luminance one stack for red for green and for blue each will have their own um, flat frames each will have their own dark flats maybe, each will have their own dark frames, depending on whether the exposure times are the same or not, etc., etc. So you want to process those stacks separately. And this is very much the same process that I used in previous videos uh, in narrowband about how I process my stacks for narrowband, whether it's across multiple nights or across multiple filters, the system in the same is the same. If you've looked at this corner of the video, you might have seen that I've put maybe a couple of videos with with, uh, the pre that include the pre-processing for uh, narrowband images. Today also we'll be using uh, PixInsight, but really this method can be used in uh, GIMP, in Photoshop, or in my personal favorite these days in terms of free software, Cyril, uh, which is something that I really, really like. Um, but enough, uh, enough talk, let's get started. I'll make sure, by the way, to put my data in uh, the comments uh, in the description of um, of this so that you can actually play with my data and also i'll make sure that uh, i'll put, put a link in the description as well where uh, you have more data that you can play with so here we are in pix insights and my subject for today is drum roll the uh what is it the pinwheel yes it is it is awesome uh, i actually <laughs> remembered what i was wanting to show you guys so this image is maybe a total of just one hour of exposure time. It was in a Bordel 4-5, um, not so far from Tokyo. It was right next to the sea. The seeing was terrible. The wind was horrible. My mount was, ter was not uh, well optimized. I was not properly polar aligned. And uh, yeah, it was not great. I don't remember the whole, the whole detail. It was actually more than two years ago. Uh, but here we have, and you can see I have four images because I have four stacks, the luminance, uh, the red, the green, uh, the blue here, and the green. Now, um, if you want to play with some other data, by the way, I recommend using uh, looking at light vortex astronomy, for example, where they have a, a few examples here on uh, a few famous deep sky objects where you can data, download the data from. Uh, you'll notice, by the way, when you download the data, those sets of data have an additional complexity in that luminance is typically taken with binning of one per one, so the full frame of the camera really with the, f the whole of the pixels, while red, green, and blue, they're taking, taken with binning two times two, which means that each set of four pixels actually becomes one super pixel, which increases signal to noise ratio. If you're not really familiar with binning, don't worry, I have a video about that if you want to have a look. Um, but that means that you'll need to resample re the luminance uh, to the same size as red, green, and blue. And this is a technique that's used by a lot of um, uh, monochrome imagers using luminance red, green, and blue filters is uh, because the whole details of the image is carried by the luminance filter, you can bin and lose resolution, lose details in red, green, blue, while you gain signal to noise ratio because red, green, and blue will tend to be noisier than luminance for the same integration time. So um, binning them avoids this kind of issue. And we know that we don't need that much resolution, that much details in the color channels because the details is added by the luminance channel. So this is a whole like lot of uh, a good way to do things, but I am not going to focus on the capture itself today because it's been raining and cloudy for ages here. And so I don't have the potential, the possibility to even show you that. So 
uh, let's focus on the processing. Now, if you've stacked your images the way that I typically do it, which is using a single reference frame, um, everything is lined up together. And here my images, you can see there, uh, if I zoom out, there it is they are actually lined up together perfectly. If they were not lined up together, you would want to go to the, uh, the pixel site process uh, star alignment. And in the star alignment, you can choose as a view, maybe your luminance filter as uh, the base, and then you can add views, you can add the rest, the red, uh, green and blue uh, channels say OK, and then click on that global button. And that would create basically a red, green and blue registered images, meaning they'd be aligned to the stars of your luminance image. So that would be the first step if your images are not aligned. OK, now, what do I want to do next? Uh, first, I see that I have some like stack stacking artifacts on the side. So as with everything, I will want to crop my image. So for that, we're going to go in here and we're going to use the dynamic dynamic crop uh, tool. Here it is. And I'm going to stay fairly close to my subject, uh, which is the pinwheel galaxy. This was taken with just a 300 millimeter f4 lens. So it's not like the, um, uh, the, the deepest, let's say deep sky uh, image that I've ever taken. But we can do something like uh, like this where I am centered on uh, the galaxy proper. And once I have uh, chosen my um, my crop, I can basically drag and drop it to the other images first. Like this. And then I can validate my dynamic crop. And now we have the same images. And now it's really very close to what you would do with a color image, except that you have four images that you're working with when you start. Now, one of the things you'll notice is that each of those images have a gradient. Uh, I do not remember exactly the source of that gradient. I'm pretty sure that I did not use flat frames at the, at the time. So it's not uh, great. But how do you deal with gradients? When you're using PixInsight, you typically be doing a dynamic background extraction. But dynamic background extraction is basically where you click on the image and you can say like, okay, these are the samples I want to use. The PixInsight will take sample uh, samples from the background and use those samples to create a nice, like smooth, uh, kind of like um, luminance shape, kind of a shape of the background. And it will subtract that shape of the background from what you have. It works well, especially on complex um, background gradients that are not really easy to deal with. But I'm not going to use the dynamic background instruction for this particular image, because if you look at the image, the, gr the gradient is very linear. It's like going from left to right. It's an extremely lim linear gradient. And actually for linear gradients, like I see here, or even like a gradient that's more like like uh, vignetting, um, which is like darkening of the corners, that kind of stuff. Instead of dynamic background extraction, the automated background extraction works better or automatic background extractor works better. Now, for me, this is a linear uh, gradient. There might be some hint of a curve like this here. So what you want to do is basically adapt if you're going to use I, I, automatic background extractor is to adapt the uh, function degree to whatever complexity you see here. The general rule of thumb is that if you see a linear gradient, you want to put the function de degree to one, I typically put it to two just to be safe. And if you see a vignetting type of thing, uh, you'll want to put it to three. And if you see other patterns, typically you'll want to go to the dynamic background extraction. So for me, I'll just apply a function degree of two. All of my images seem to have the same gradient. I trust my own judgment. So I'll just go inside, say that I want to subtract and I'm going to discard the background model. model. I'm going to replace the target image. No going back. I trust myself. I trust my ju judgment and I am totally right to do so because the background seems to be properly um, extracted and we get proper uh, pictures with that. So I'm going to apply that to the rest of the images.
and we're already done. And so now we have properly background extracted luminance, red, green, and blue uh, images. And now what's really cool with, uh, with this kind of, uh, of setup is that you can process kind of each, each image separately depending on how well it is working. You can do the same with a color image, by the way, if you've taken a color shot from a one shot color camera, you can open uh, the, uh, the shot and you have two buttons here at the top and the one on the right will actually extract the red, green, and blue channels from your color image. The one on the left will extract the luminance. And so you would end up after using those two buttons with ex exactly those four images that you can process separately. Now for processing in PixInsight, I, you, if you know my channel, you know that I absolutely love the free and basically open source uh, easy processing suite, which is a plugin for PixInsight. I highly recommend it because it's nothing short of magical. And I'll put a link in the description down below on uh, where you can actually add that repository. This is an amazing piece of work. It's made by uh, a Nina one of the main Nina contributors, Dark Arkan, and it's absolutely, it's awesome. Um, now, what I will want to do is I will want to run a deconvolution. So first you can see the quality of my data, by the way, it's terrible. I'm out of focus. I have um, a short integration time and my tracking was not good. So we're not gonna get something exceptional. Let's, uh, let's be very cognizant of that from the start. I'm gonna first do some deconvolution. Deconvolution is extremely efficient on galaxy images because you can actually extract more details out of the galaxy proper. And I can go to my script, run easy decon, and easy decon will be run on the L filter because that's the filter that contains the details of the images and the deconvolution lets me eke out all of those details. So I can create a new uh, raw star mask on my, uh, on my image. This uses Starnet++, takes a bit of time. And then, you know, I can apply some boost or maybe even stretch to uh, the stars, boost them, uh, dilate them to make them a bit bigger, and this should be uh, good enough. I can create a background mask, and here we are, and then I can run the deconvolution. Like ideally, I'd be doing that first on the preview, uh, and then I'd be doing like um, a evaluate easy decon run on that preview until I get the right settings, and then I would apply those settings to the whole image. Um, but you know, I'm going to do it to the whole image directly because I just want to show you the overall workflow. I'm also needing to generate um, a point spread function uh, for the image, which is basically the average star shape. And then we can run the easy deconvolution on our image. And here it is done. We have the result. And we indeed have eked out a bit more details out of this out of focus galaxy. So this is good. And this is kind of the magic of easy decon. Now at the same time, we can see that there is a bit of ringing around this. Uh, I think it's a star here rather than a part of the galaxy. So it's not perfect, which means that when you have the creation of the mask, whether you're creating it from scratch or using the automated uh, star, mark, star mask creation from the easy decon tool, there is an ellipse tool that is available to actually add protection for stars that have not been included in the uh, Starnet++ mask. So that, so that would actually fix this, but you know, I'm too lazy and I don't really care that much. So now we've done the easy deconvolution and really my next step would be, and you'll, not, you'll notice a pattern if you've seen my previous um, processing runs, I'm doing exactly the same as with narrowband images, really. Um, I'd be going to uh, especially red, green, blue to do some um, easy uh, denoise. But it so happens that, you know, the uh, processing actually takes a long time and I'm feeling a bit too lazy today, so I'm not going to uh, do it. You just have to be aware that TGV denoise in the um, in the easy denoise uh, part or in general will be taking care of the uh, low frequency noise, which is basically uh, like small grain kind of pixel noise, while the multi-scale median transform takes care of the medium frequency noise, which is like kind of blotches of air areas of different like noise in there and you often want to actually have a not very strong TGV denoise with a very strong multi-scale medium transform and you really want to check what works the best for you. Um, okay, so 
Uh, we've, de we've deconvolved the uh, air filter. If we haven't been too lazy, we've also denoised at least the red, green, and blue filters, maybe also even the L filters. Maybe the L, since it has more signal to noise ratio, we'd use less aggressive parameters in the denoise. And now is the time to actually combine those. And to combine those uh, images together, I'm just going to use the LRGB combination tool in PixInsight. But you want to make sure that you use that tool on nonlinear images. So linear images are those images where if I remove any preview, I see pretty much nothing except that the signal is there. And for the eye, which is kind of a, the eye apply, uh, applies a logarithmic kind of function on the luminosity of the world around us, uh, we want to apply the same kind of function uh, on the image and that's called stretching the image into a non-linear domain. Right now it's linear because we've just counted photons. The sensor has caught photons and just told me how many photons arrived. So it's just linear. More photons means like if I have two more, two more photons and I had two photons before, I just multiply my signal, signal by two. That's it. Some of the processing needs to be done in a linear state like the deconvolution and the um, noise reduction that I'm doing. Uh, with the easy processing suite, uh, other process needs to be done on a non-linear stretched image. So to do the stretch, if you're using the standard PixInsight without the easy processing suite, I would recommend the math stretch uh, function here. And you basically want to set a target background. I like the uh, value of 0 0.2 or 0 0.1716 typically. And you may want to adjust your background reference. You can just like hover around on the background, look at the little K values that appear here here at the bottom, you can see it's like goes to 0 0.001. So I would want to maybe put 0 0.0015 just to be safe. And that will be the upper limit of my background. And I do that for each of the images. Or I am lazy and I go to the easy processing suite and I use the easy soft stretch on each of those images using the default settings. I'm going to select uh, blue, set easy soft stretch, it's done. And I'm going to do the same for each of the other images. And I am done. So I am left with uh, images that have been stretched. So they are no longer linear, which means that I can apply the LRGB combination process in PixInsight. So I'll just choose my luminance frame for the L and we'll do the same red, green and blue. I personally like to check the chrominance noise reduction, full disclosure. I'm not exactly sure what it does, but I like it. So I'll, uh, it makes me feel better psychologically speaking as well. So I just check it and I'll press on the uh, global uh, button here, the little round uh, icon to actually get those channels uh, smashed together into a color image. And here we are. <laughs> That was quick. So now we have a color image, which is just a standard stretched color image that I can process as usual. So one of the first things that I do is simply do um, a color calibration. So here I would want to go to my um, uh, photometric color calibration function. And here it is. And we want to search for coordinates. This is M101. I'm gonna just gonna search for it. It's gonna take me to the coordinates. And my focal length was 300 millimeters. My pixel size is 3.8 micrometers, but because I actually uh, drizzled this data, meaning I increased the resolution per two, my actual pixel, si pixel size for the purpose of the photometric color calibration has to be divided by two. So it is 1.9. Um, and I am just going to apply this to the image. The average spiral galaxy is probably good. Uh, maybe we could try elliptical galaxy. Uh, I'm not sure what type of galaxy this one would be, but I am just going to apply this to the image. We're going to wait for the process to be done. And this, this will have uh, basically done the color calibration of uh, the image. And it really identifies the region in the sky that you are in to actually perform a, a color calibration. And here we are, we have some uh, analysis of the results here. Typically, if I see that, yes, indeed, the point cloud is pretty much on a, a line, it means that it has been successful. Uh, I'm going to close this. And here we have uh, a non-yellow, kind of like this was much yellower. This is now more cl closer to the blue uh, kind of color that I would expect out of this particular galaxy. So the job of the photometric color calibration is done and we can do the usual stuff. So I'm just gonna run through it. We can do some curves transformation. 
And so I am going to basically pump up the uh, contrast here between the background and the galaxy while, while still trying to maintain like kind of like the nebulosity of the galaxy around here. That's my uh, first step. Also, what I really like with monochrome uh, sensors and LRGB filters is that typically there is much less uh, color in the background of the image than there would be in a one shot color camera. So it makes the background much easier to handle. And I can typically just pump up the saturation without affecting the background too much directly on the image. Now, you can still see that the background gets colorized, so I will not do this uh, uh, saturation curve right here, but it is a good, uh, a good thing that to be aware of that is possible. So first things first, curves, then I am going to just uh, create a mask and increase the saturation. So I'm going to extract the luminance out of this image. Here it is. We're going to go inside a histogram transformation to basically select uh, this image and we're going to uh, purposefully kill the background. Something like this. Something like this is good enough. Okay, that way we can add color to the galaxy itself very easily. Here it is, it's a very aggressive, aggressive mask. We're gonna go and do some convolution on it to basically blur the mask out. Some more. There we are, we could use multi-scale uh, linear transform for that as well. Tons of methods are possible. I'm just going to apply that mask um, and then I am going to stop showing the mask because it's a bit distracting, do some uh, color saturation. And I can go in the color saturation tool. I'm going to increase my range a little bit so I have more uh, space to work. And here we are. The galaxy is getting some nice color out of this. <laughs> Isn't that fun? I mean, LRGB images are like, even when you have low signal to noise ratio are so much easier to process than uh, one shot color cameras. Even if you have to go through this uh, uh, linear stage with luminous red, green and blue that you have to process separately. So it's a bit more work. But once you have combined the images, it's just so much easier. So we're going to just uh, apply that to the image. And, you know, I could even call this a day, right? I mean, this is a decent image uh, to start with. The noise is there. So maybe at the end, I'll want to add some topaz denoise uh, to this. But, you, could, you know, we could do some uh, HDR multi-scale transform, see how that would work. Maybe five we will still add a lightness mask on top of the mask that I already have. I don't really like this because it really kills the core. I prefer to have fewer visible details, but a nice core. Um, I could go, do some local histogram uh, transformation. I could do for some further curves. Maybe what I'll do is that I will uh, remove the mask and just do some ACDNR noise reduction. We're going to apply the lightness mask. When I see this kind of level of noise, uh, I think that actually before that, I'm going to rescale the image. I should have done that in the linear stage really, but we're going to do that right now, which is integer resample because I have indeed um, uh, drizzled this image. So I have twice as much resolution as the uh, optical resolution of the image. And by doing so, I would lower my, I would make my, my signal to noise ratios higher by resampling the image. But really I should have done that on the individual luminance red, green and blue uh, linear images. And that's a bit more like it. We've, we've neutralized a bit of the noise. We haven't murdered the galaxy itself too much. And uh, yeah, we can do some more curves now to actually uh, kill the background a bit more because that's, what, uh, that's one of the things that uh, the, um, the noise reduction lets us do. And here it is. This is not too bad at all. I kind of like this image. And we could say that this is, uh, you know, our final image. We could play with curves a bit more. There's lots of little things that can be done. But, you know, it's from this point on, it's really diminishing returns. And I'm too lazy for diminishing returns. I know that a lot of people could get a much better result than this with my data. Uh, but, you know, I like what I'm getting right now. I could do one last thing, which is using the easy processing suite. Uh, do a quick uh, star reduction. 
and just run the easy star reduction using the uh, the second methodology see how it works it uses starnet plus plus again um, so yeah that's uh, that's something that takes a bit of time but here it is the stars are a bit like less blobby uh, right uh, there are there are circles around the star so it's not perfect but this is something we can do it's not super visible in the final image and you know what let's call this a day so i just want to show that you know lrgb imaging does not have to be complicated you can keep it very simple uh, when you capture uh, let's say 50 percent of your total integration time will be on l 50 percent on rgb equally okay uh, RGB, you can uh, do binning two by two if needed, and L, you keep binning one by one, so you have more resolution on L. Once you stack that and you open that in the software, you'll just be uh, doing dynamic background extraction, noise reduction, deconvolution on L, and on the other images without the deconvolution typically, you'll want to make sure that you do an integer resample of the L to match the two, di two times two binning of the RGB, or you, you may want to upscale the RGB, I'm not sure exactly what other images do. You do the LRGB combination after a soft stretch from the easy processing suite or a masked stretch from Pix Insights. You do your photometric color calibration. You play with curves. You play with uh, saturation and you're done, right? It's, it's, I find monochrome data with LRGB filters much easier to play with than with, with color cameras. But I hope this basically demystifies a bit the LRGB process. It makes it look a bit simpler and it is simple. It is much easier to deal with monochrome data. And, you know, I hope that you got something out of this uh, video. So with that, thank you so much for watching. Uh, if you are not a subscriber to this channel and you're into astronomy, astrophotography, you want to uh, get your game up to the next level, you're interested in new material, you're interested in how, read, how noise in astrophotography works, you're interested in getting better pictures you may want to subscribe to my channel click on that little, little notification bell and you know uh, as always thank you so much for watching if you like this video please click on the like button leave a comment down below with criticism suggestions advice uh, whatever you want uh, it's always welcome and you know as always uh, don't forget whenever you can to look up at the stars and I'll see you next time